We'll get started. Uh, you can mute your audio and turn off your video until uh, Q&A at the end of the presentation. If you do have a question, you can use the chat uh, to ask a question during the presentation. Handouts uh, are out on the PC Club website, or Jim will probably post uh, to the chat room in a few minutes there. Agenda, we'll do some club status stuff quickly, and then we'll get to our main topic. Uh, we have the Max SIG coming up uh, on Friday, January 19th at 11.30, and uh, I think Mike did just publish uh, uh, an agenda, but he usually covers the current things, and there's new stuff from uh, uh, out in Vegas uh, uh, and that, so we'll probably talk about some of that stuff. Uh, the next question and answer, uh, usually the first Tuesday of the month, will be, uh, oh, it says January 9th. Uh, that's wrong. It should be February 6th, I believe. But it's the first Tuesday uh, there in February. Uh, and then our next uh, general meeting will be February 21st, and the topic will be online security and passwords. Uh, so we've talked about passwords and password managers uh, kind of a new thing now, uh, if you follow the computers, you probably heard about pass keys. Uh, and uh, if pass keys are available uh, for the sites or the services that you're using, uh, most people will recommend uh, uh, replacing your password with a pass key. So we'll talk about uh, how that works and, uh, and things like that. And then just in general, some tips to keep you safe. Officers, we've got Jim as our president, Linda as our vice president, Paul as our secretary, our membership secretary, Paul Law as our treasurer, uh, Chuck as our recording secretary, uh, Mike uh, now leads the MAXIG, Andrew is our communication coordinator, I'm a director at large, and volunteers. Dues, uh, dues are $8 a year. Uh, uh, usually we have more people in attendance, uh, but, uh, and if Paul was here, Paul could take it. Uh, but Paul does send out a notice when your uh, membership is due, and uh, your membership is due on the anniversary of when you join the club. So it's not like the first of the year, everybody uh, uh, has to renew there. So you will get notifications from Paul when it does. But also, if you're changing your email, uh, make sure and notify us because that's the way we keep in touch and send out the notices. Suggestions for topics, you can email, you can talk to the board members. We're always looking for people to present uh, on hardware and software. Uh, so that's going on. Our website, uh, we have the past meetings, uh, the slides and handouts and recordings. We also have a deal section, and we have a monthly uh, eBytes newsletter. And uh, in the eBytes newsletter, there's just some uh, links to uh, current topics. Uh, you can ask a question. Uh, there's question and answer stuff in there, uh, uh, things like that. We just concluded this survey uh, for 2024, so it ended the end of the end of 2023. Uh, I wanted to thank the 53 people, uh, which is over half of the people currently in the club did respond, so thank you very much. Uh, we ask a lot of questions, or I ask a lot of questions, because uh, I uh, enjoy seeing the trends, and it helps us as the board uh, make important decisions about the club and the presentations and uh, what's popular and things like that. And you'll see in today's presentation, I'm using... Uh, uh, quite a bit, or uh, some of the statistics also. Okay, our topic today, uh, main topic, is Future Tech and Trends by myself, Tom Kreitzer. PCs and devices over the past 50 years have evolved from the desktop to now almost everywhere in everything. We've got computers, CPUs, memory, smart devices. We've got everything and everywhere there. Whereas uh, when I first started, certainly uh, the best thing that you had was a desktop computer of some sort. Where is it headed and what should we do? That's the real question there. It's been a wild ride and the ride shows no signs of stopping. Today we have many choices when it comes to what devices to use. 
So that's that trends, uh, what we're doing and what we're currently doing. Picking the right one is like picking a motor vehicle. What works for one person or purpose doesn't work for everyone to do everything. So just like we have all different models of cars and trucks and stuff like that, you have all different computers, uh, whether it's smartphones, tablets, laptops, desktops, and, and then all the variations in between. And uh, there isn't one device that uh, works perfectly for everybody because as far as I've seen, no two people use their devices the exact same way. So it's good that we've got all these choices. Uh, once you define your needs and what they are, then you can find the right device to use for every task. Okay, uh, this is some statistics from the recent PC Club survey uh, where we asked how many people have a smartphone or a tablet. Uh, so the blue line is the smartphones and the uh, uh, light pink or purple line is the tablet. And we uh, only started asking the question in 2014, so that's where it starts. And when we first started asking the question uh, at that time in 2014, 61% of the people had a smartphone. Since that time, we've gone up. In fact, last year was the first year that we ever had everyone that responded had a smartphone. Uh, and I would have expected that to continue, but one person in the survey did not have a smartphone this year, and you know who you are. <laughs> uh, so, so we're down to 98, but still 98 is almost everybody. Uh, data plans and device costs have dropped every day, so you can't use an excuse of it's too expensive or uh, things like that. Uh, you, you just can't do that. Uh, if you do have a smartphone, you have a powerful computer with you 7 by 24 anywhere you're at. And as an example, I, I always tell people if they say, well, it's too expensive. Well, I have a T-Mobile plan. Uh, it's a prepaid plan. Uh, I pay $15 for unlimited talk, unlimited text, and 3.5 gigabytes of data. So who can't afford $15 a month? Uh, the phone I use is a Samsung A14 and lists at $199, and you can find it on sale for 149 or even 129 So you don't have to spend thousands of dollars to buy a new phone. You don't have to spend hundreds of dollars on an unlimited data plan. There's, there's options for everybody. Tablets, a sim uh, similar type of deal. Uh, back in 2014, we had 60% of the people had tablets. Uh, today, we have 81% have tablets. Uh, to me, this is a, a bit of a shame uh, that this number isn't 100 or close to uh, the smartphones there. Prices for tablets start at less than $30. So again, that price barrier to get this powerful computer is, is nothing there. I use my tablet uh, more than I use my PC at home, my laptop or my desktop. In fact, I've got multiple tablets. Uh, and I'm not ready to give up my laptop and desktop, but a tablet can do many things, especially when it comes to uh, looking up information, checking on my email, uh, doing a variety of things. Uh, so I'll use my tablet in my kitchen if I'm cooking or looking up uh, recipes, uh, in a garage if I'm working on something in the bathroom, if I'm streaming video, so I use it as a second TV. I can walk anywhere around that I can connect to my Wi-Fi and I can stream my TV there. So uh, bedroom, I can be out on my deck, I can be almost anywhere. And I mentioned here last month I uh, did buy a new iPad. I bought the iPad 9th generation and, I, and it was on sale for $229. Uh, Apple still sells the ninth generation. Uh, they do sell a tenth generation, but at this time I really don't recommend the tenth generation because the tenth generation has a list price of $449 and really doesn't offer that much more. So save yourself close to $200 and 
buy a ninth generation. And you can buy the ninth generations at Target or Best Buy or online or almost any places. Uh, they may not be on sale right now, but uh, keep your eye open and you'll find uh, sales. This is another tablet uh, that's been uh, mentioned by PC Magazine. Uh, they like this Doji, and I personally haven't used it, uh, so I can't attest to it. But it's a 10.1-inch Android tablet, and it's on sale for $69. And, and again, you can find even cheaper tablets out there, but this is an example of an even cheaper uh, tablet there. Okay, some more trends from the PC survey. Uh, we ask a question, what percent of time do you spend on your tablet, smartphone, and then uh, on your desktop or laptop? So of the 100% of uh, computing that you do, where do you spend your time, on the smartphone, tablet, or computer? Well, currently uh, on the smartphone, the uh, people are averaging 34% of their time is spent on the smartphone looking things up, checking mail, doing whatever. Tablet, 16%, and computer, and the computer would be either the desktop or the laptop, 50% of the time there. The computer numbers from 2014, when I first started asking the question, 81% of the time people were spending on their laptop. So certainly this number has been going down and down and down, and I expect it to continue that way because you can do more and more on the smartphones and more and more on the tablets uh, to the point where uh, uh, less and less really has to be spent on, on a desktop or a laptop. In fact, uh, I've got my dad. My dad, uh, in a week and a half, turns 97. He used to have a desktop computer a couple years ago, and he moved into a smaller apartment, uh, uh, one uh, one bedroom apartment, so he didn't really have that much room. So uh, uh, when did he move? Four years ago or five years ago? And then at that time, uh, got him an Apple iPad. Uh, he doesn't need a computer. He does everything on the iPad. Uh, the iPad uh, lets him check his mail, lets him go out to YouTube, lets him go out to Facebook, uh, uh, lets him do everything that he needs to do. When I'm over at his place and he has to do some things that may require a little more typing to make it easier, I have a Bluetooth keyboard. $20 I paid for a Bluetooth keyboard. I connect it to the tablet. In a sense, I've got a little laptop there. I can type real easily and uh, get, get things in. So there's, there's things that you can do. And when I talk to a lot of seniors and they're looking to upgrade or uh, buy a new laptop, I, I really have to ask them, well, what are you really doing? Do you really need a laptop or is a tablet sufficient for what you're going to do? And a lot of people uh, can get by without even buying a laptop or a desktop anymore. Okay, next let's talk about uh, these different devices. Each of the device categories we'll talk about. And we'll talk about what are the pros and what are the cons for that particular device. Well, obviously a smartphone, uh, the biggest pro there is it acts as a phone. Uh, so you can make calls and you can receive calls. Another nice thing is it's small. Uh, being that it's small, it's portable. It'll fit in your pocket or your purse. Uh, there's a low upfront cost, although some people have expensive cell phone plans. But as we talked about, it really doesn't have to cost you $15 a month and uh, less than $200 for a phone. They're also great for music, listening to music, uh, taking video, and replacing your camera. And another big advantage is there's millions of apps that let you do almost everything under the sun. Some of the cons for the phone is, yes, you do have the cost of the monthly data plans, and if you don't have an unlimited plan, you do have to manage uh, maybe what you uh, stream or uh, how much data you use. Uh, the displays, the display is usually around five and six inches. Uh, so smaller displays, uh, limited storage, but you can store uh, using the cloud storage. So you don't have to have a lot of storage on your device. You can use the cloud. Uh, one of the other cons, uh, some people may look at this as a, a pro, is 
the models are changing yearly, new features and functions and stuff like that. But usually uh, what that means is your phone, uh, uh, after about three or four years, is pretty well outdated. The battery isn't holding the charge as much. So it's time to replace it. So they, they aren't going to last as long as some of the other devices. Content creation can be hard uh, because if you're using the on on screen keyboard, uh, it can be a little bit hard. You don't have a mouse and a small display. And they can be easy to lose or break. Maybe not so much break because they've certainly got a lot better, but in the early days, if you dropped it or looked at it sideways, uh, the screen might crack or uh, uh, slip out of your hand and, uh, you know, there goes, uh, there goes the phone. Okay, next device, tablet. Uh, some of the pros, uh, it's great for content consumption. So if you're web browsing, email, watching movie, playing music or playing games, it's good. Another pro is, at least compared to the smartphone, it's a much bigger display. Usually you're talking between 7 inches and 10 inches, and there's even some getting up into the 12-inch category now. Portable and lightweight. So uh, uh, I'll be on my couch at home, and uh, I usually have a tablet uh, close at hand uh, or maybe holding it there. So unlike a laptop, the... Uh, that's heavy and maybe more bulky or things like that, here you can have something that's very portable. And it, although laptops, Jim is raising his laptop and uh, uh, yes, uh, there, there are some lighter models, but uh, in general it is uh, lighter and more portable. Uh, easier to use than a phone. So uh, uh, for if somebody is first starting out with stuff or haven't done a lot of technology, tablets are great for them because uh, the screen is bigger, so it's easier to type, it's easier to click on items than a smaller phone there. And uh, just the same as a phone, you have millions of apps out there. Some of the cons of the tablet, content creation can be hard uh, because uh, the on-screen keyboard, even though it's bigger than a phone, still isn't uh, the easiest to use. No mouse, smaller display than typically a laptop or a desktop unit. Also, you may have monthly uh, costs for data plans. If you want to use your tablet in a car or somewhere where you're not connected to Wi-Fi, uh, then you might be paying for a data plan uh, and uh, the capability of the tablet to uh, connect to uh, uh, cell data there. Uh, smaller display than a laptop or a desktop. Limited storage, but again, you can use the cloud storage. Limited camera, so it is more like a webcam. So uh, almost every smartphone has a better camera than most, uh, most uh, tablets because, you know, I, I have seen people on vacation try and use tablets to take pictures, and I just, it, it makes me laugh when I see them because... They're holding this big thing, and, and you know, you can't stick it in your pocket or your purse that easily, so uh, have a phone. Use the phone. Usually you've got uh, uh, 50 more features on that phone than what you have on the, on the uh, tablet for taking pictures also, so uh, not a good idea for, uh, for a camera except for a uh, webcast or things like that. Okay, next let's talk about a Chromebook. Uh, Chromebooks, uh, the major advantage there is low cost. Uh, they start at $150. Uh, basic ones, you can get good basic ones for $300 to $600. And a lot of the Chromebooks have touch screens. Uh, so, you, so if all you need is the basics, that may be the perfect fit there. Uh, because they use the Chrome operating system and not a Windows, not a Microsoft Windows or an Apple iOS, uh, the CPU, it can run with a, a lower-powered CPU and still outperform Windows, let's say, in browsing or in, uh, playing YouTube or, or things like that. Also requires less memory, uh, which keeps the cost of the hardware down uh, because it doesn't have to be as robust as these other operating systems. Usually you have very fast startup, uh, long-lasting battery life, usually... Uh, twice as long as a lot of laptops and that out there. Uh, so you have that. 
And recently, the companies that make the Chromebooks have committed to a 10-year end-of-life cycle. Uh, in the past, when you bought a Chromebook, you were, uh, you were limited in how many years the company would make updates to your Chrome operating system. And typically, when you bought it, you may only have three years or five years left uh, that the company was going to uh, update that device. Well, now they've all committed to 10 years. So uh, if you, in the past, you were fearful of buying something and then it not getting updated after three years, uh, that's no longer a concern there. Some of the cons of a uh, Chromebook, uh, limited software. Uh, because uh, if there's software written specifically for Windows, uh, let's say it's like Quicken or TurboTax, uh, it won't run on a Chromebook. Uh, it, but the Chromebook uh, certainly can run a browser, can run a ton of uh, public domain software. Uh, and if you run the browser, frequently you can connect to uh, sites. So if you wanted to use TurboTax, you can connect to the uh, through, through the browser to TurboTax and do your TurboTax. You just can't load the TurboTax locally on your Chromebook uh, because there is no version of TurboTax for the Chromebook. Uh, also, you have uh, cloud internet web connection is mostly required uh, because this is counting on uh, uh, a lot of the functionality. Uh, you're usually limited if you don't have a connection uh, to Wi-Fi or, or that, you uh, may be limited in what you can do. Limited storage, again, on these Chromebooks, but you can use the cloud storage. Uh, in the past, this is where the end of life date for some of the older Chromebooks uh, was five to eight years, and that's no longer a con, but if you are buying on the secondary market or have run into this in the past, it's an important uh, change there. Also on these devices, there's limited hardware ports, uh, similar to a phone or a tablet in terms of how to connect them or to add things. Okay, a laptop. What are some of the pros of the laptop? Content creation. Uh, so if you're writing, if you're doing spreadsheets, uh, things like that, usually a laptop uh, is, is the better solution than a a uh, tablet, <clears throat> excuse me, a tablet or a smartphone. Portable, uh, you can use it from room to room, outside, take to work, classes, travel, etc. They usually have a bigger display than a tablet, uh, maybe 12 inches to 17 inches, which is pretty good size. Uh, full size keyboard, or uh, some of them do have the shrunk down keyboard, but it's certainly bigger than trying to touch type on a screen. <coughs> Uh, requires less space to set up and use. Uh, all of them come with a webcam and a mic, so if you're doing uh, calls, uh, uh, it can be very handy there. You don't have to have a separate device. Uh, and if you do need other ports, uh, you can usually hook into a docking station to get uh, multiple displays, uh, multiple uh, USBs, uh, things like that. Some of the cons of the laptop. Uh, they cost more when you buy or to upgrade than a desktop computer. Uh, they have slower CPUs, uh, and that's usually to extend the battery life. So uh, they don't run them as fast as a desktop or that, because a desktop you don't have to worry about the power consumption. Uh, usually you also have limited resolution, uh, and by that I mean, uh, well, is it a 720, is it a 1K, uh, uh, how many pixels by how many pixels do you have on the screen there or in the graphics card? And so that's, that's going to limit your resolution. And even like my laptop is a relatively inexpensive laptop, uh, but uh, uh, if I want to get a, a higher quality screen, I'd have to buy a, a more expensive laptop to get that in the graphics card. Uh, smaller, slower hard drives, uh, that's to conserve power again. Memory tends to cost more than a desktop. Uh, limited uh, internal expandability, if you did want to add uh, uh, more memory, drives, graphics, usually you can't. 
uh, more costly to repair because the stuff is jammed and glued together. Uh, can be easy to uh, steal or lose. Uh, uh, you may leave it in a car or you, somebody may steal it at the airport. Uh, less comfortable to use, and this usually is that keyboard. Uh, maybe a smaller keyboard. So if you're used to a full-size keyboard and you start typing on one of these, uh, you may be fumbling around a little bit. Okay, desktop. Uh, the pros, performance. If you want the best performance, you're going to be doing video editing, things like that. Usually you're going to want a, a desktop there. Cost. It's the best value for the performance that you're getting. Usually you have a bigger display uh, because you have a desktop to put it on, or you may even have multiple displays, uh, so uh, they're more powerful. User interface, you have the full keyboard and a mouse, uh, more hardware ports, faster drives, uh, whether they're uh, spinning hard drives or solid-state hard drives or DVDs, uh, because, again, uh, power isn't uh, uh, a concern there, so you can usually get faster drives uh, for the same amount of money that uh, it costs in, in a laptop. The cons, not portable. Uh, take up more physical space, generates more noise, heat, uh, and weighs more. Okay, so that's that kind of gave you, hopefully gave you some ideas on the trends of, uh, of the different devices there. Let's talk about the future and what's going on here. And uh, this, I, I mentioned before, uh, uh, this is from uh, when I was growing up anyway. You had uh, George Jetson and his family, and you had uh, uh, Rosie the Robot there. And uh, a lot of the things that were shown in that show uh, back in the 60s, have now, now we've got it in our smartphones. We've got it. I'm still waiting for the flying cars and uh, uh, a few of the things, but... Uh, uh, we've come a long way in, uh, in what I would call a short period of time, especially when you consider that, uh, okay, that was 50 years ago. Well, if we go back uh, to the early uh, uh, 1900s uh, or that, uh, uh, what did they have then? Well, a lot of people didn't even have electricity. <laughs> so, you know, we've come a long way. Uh, let's talk quickly about uh, the future, uh, specifically Microsoft Windows. Uh, most of us, or all of us, should at least be using uh, Windows 10. Uh, Windows 10 came out in 2015 and is going to be uh, sunsetted or uh, uh, shut down in October 2025. So uh, Microsoft usually supports an operating system for 10 years. Uh, what that means is if you've got uh, any laptops or desktops that are currently running Windows 10 uh, that cannot be updated to Windows 11, now's the time to start thinking about and buying a new machine there. So uh, don't wait till the last minute. There may be some shortages uh, when that starts rolling around. Uh, so you'll want to keep an eye open there. Uh, one caveat uh, that I'll mention, uh, I, I have... Um, a couple of people before Christmas uh, uh, ask about a computer that they had seen online. And you can get some ridiculous prices of computers, uh, $150 for a mini desktop, uh, and has a ton of memory, it has a fast CPU, supports 4K video. The only trouble is it can't run Windows 11. So you'd essentially be buying a computer for $150 that you'd use for another year. Uh, I would not recommend that. Uh, so if the machine cannot be updated to Windows 11, don't buy it. Windows 11 came out in 2021, uh, and so it has a lifespan probably till 2031, roughly 2031. Windows 12. Windows 12 comes out this year. If you haven't heard, uh, probably in June of this year. Uh, so uh, it's it's on its way here. Uh, and uh, uh, so if you're going to be buying new machines, if you bought a new machine now that can run Windows 11, it'll be able to run Windows 12. So uh, it's only those old machines that uh, are running Windows 10 
that cannot be updated to Windows 11 because Windows 11 has improved security that requires uh, a certain uh, secure chip on the computer itself. And if you haven't bought a new computer or a computer that's been manufactured in the last <laughs> three to four years, it does not have that chip on there. And so Microsoft does not support Windows 11 on any of those <coughs> machines. Okay, this I just show uh, the future of CPUs. Lots of dots out there, uh, but uh, we won't go into each of the dots there. Uh, they're for different deals. The number of cores that you find in a CPU, the watts that they use, the frequency that they run at, uh, single thread performance, and transistors. The transistors is what kind of gets me because I was uh, born in the age when uh, we first had tubes. So you didn't have transistors, uh, and uh, tubes essentially was one transistor. Uh, and then you started getting transistors, and if you had a pocket radio, AM, because FM wasn't around, uh, AM, you wanted a couple of transistor, at least a couple of transistors in the radio there, and the better ones had nine or ten transistors in there. Well. Things have evolved. Uh, when the first computers were coming out, certainly uh, they were single, single core uh, processors, and the number of transistors in there was very small. And a transistor, think of a transistor as the ability, uh, uh, if you're not familiar with a transistor, it's a gate. It's a gate, and it can represent a one or a zero. Uh, and so uh, having more transistors lets you both in terms of memory, but also in processing of making decisions and things like that, you need hundreds and hundreds and thousands of transistors. Now we've gotten to the point here, uh, the latest model of the Apple M3 uh, CPU has 16 central processing units, CPUs, has 40 GPUs, that's graphic processing units, and has 92 billion transistors on that little CPU. I mean, to me, it's just incredible how they can pack that on there and, and that. So the CPUs get better and faster and more, which is good because that enables everything else. Uh, probably the next most important thing uh, would be the display. Uh, displays have already always been one of the biggest hindrances in computers uh, because somehow you've got to get feedback back to a person. Now they've improved over the years. In fact, uh, uh, the first computer that I was looking at uh, in popular mechanics when I was growing up uh, was uh, uh, it had no display whatsoever. You had lights. That's it. You had the light was either on or off. That was your interface was light. So coming from lights to a display, <laughs> to and the displays that we had were the, uh, uh, the TV tube, uh, big heavy displays. And as they started getting 17 inch and, and things like that, you had these monstrosities that weighed a ton uh, and threw off a lot of heat and uh, uh, would blow fuses uh, if you connected too many together. Uh, I remember at 3M when I was putting in some of the some of the units there, and and the maintenance was uh, was going because uh, uh, I, I, I asked the guy. I said, "Well, are you going through and rewiring it uh, for the new terminals? Because uh, we were replacing dumb terminals, some of the dumb terminals with computers, and these had the monitors." And they said, uh, "No, we have no plans to do it. We'll just." fix it as they short out <laughs> and run a new line and, and uh, do it. So uh, things have changed, but uh, displays, uh, uh, if you've seen uh, some of the hype from CES out in Las Vegas that just concluded uh, uh, earlier, uh, well, last Friday or so, uh, you have uh, displays and uh, some of them are, uh, you can see through di the display. Uh, which is okay, but uh, again, that's not where I want to be. Uh, you have flexible displays. You have the bending. You have the unfolding. You have different things there. You have Apple and its Vision Pro. Uh, so this is this is the Apple Vision Pro. 
You can get your order in today. Uh, it's 3500 uh, If you're not familiar, you have to go in for a fitting. Uh, so you have to sign up uh, to get one of these. It's kind of like buying a car. You go in for a fitting, and, and they actually fit it. Plus, uh, you cannot leave the store until you go through a 25-minute introduction on how to use it. So they don't want people going out of the store and saying, this is a piece of crap, but what can I do with it? You, you have to go through the demo and stuff like that. Uh, but the Vision Pro is coming out. Uh, you can, uh, uh, February 1st, I believe, you can, if you get on the list early. Uh, MetaQuest uh, has their uh, goggles, and uh, Google has its Google Glass. Uh, in the future, we want the screens to go away. Uh, we want it to be a combination of virtual and augmented reality, VR and AR. And so just like this uh, little screen down here where the guy is just kind of pointing out here, uh, physically, we shouldn't have to have a screen. Uh, and if you have, if the whole, if your whole site is a screen, uh, then you can have more apps going, you can have more features going, you can uh, have everything in front of you, and yet it's not taking up space in your pocket, it's not something uh, that you're wearing on your head, uh, things like that. So uh, it's, it's changing, it's still going to take some time though. Uh, next most important thing with uh, these devices and that is the input. So the output's very important, but input is just as important. Uh, keyboards have been around for a long time. Uh, if we go back to my early days with the early computer, you had no keyboard. It was physical switches. That's all you had. You didn't have. You didn't have a keyboard. So uh, uh, keyboards are nice, but keyboards uh, have limitations. Uh, not everybody is good at it. Uh, uh, you maybe have to spell things correctly. You have to do things. Whereas if we start moving more to voice and hand gestures and things like that, all of a sudden we don't have to be constrained with uh, having a physical keyboard in front of us. And uh, certainly you can see some of these capabilities in, uh, in the devices uh, like Alexa, uh, the ability for an Alexa to uh, find a voice within a room to isolate the background noise, uh, to be able to take uh, hundreds of commands and understand it uh, in all kinds of dialects and variations there. It's, it's, uh, I would say in terms of uh, display, uh, input has gotten a lot farther than what display has there. And as you add more and more artificial intelligence, uh, it, more and more of the keyboards and the input problems go away. Uh, especially, I was giving a presentation at my uh, dad's senior living facility, and uh, uh, the capabilities of the voice assistants and video assistants, well, one of the very nice things is, again, people don't have to use a keyboard. If they want to add an entry to a calendar, you can say, add entry to calendar, and it'll say, well, what day is it? What time is it? What's the event? <clears throat> And you don't have to type anything. You don't, so you can interface with a lot of these devices without a keyboard at all. Okay, another uh, thing that uh, certainly we see in all these devices is small size and cost. Uh, everything, everywhere and everything. So we're starting to see that. Uh, whether it's uh, smart home devices, uh, whether it's in your car, robots, watches, in this whole internet of things, IoT, uh, and the, that's becoming available because of the cost of the CPUs, the cost of the memory, the miniaturization, it's, it's, uh, you can put in Wi-Fi connections, you can put in all these different connections, and as an example, like a watch like this or, or that, yeah, you can buy an Apple Watch, but the watch that I use is a Wise watch, and it's $19.95, $19.95. It's a computer. It's a computer in there or a security camera for $25, uh, the capabilities in there. Uh, cars, cars now have, uh, some of the cars are having like 50 to 100 CPUs in there, different functions, different sensors, all talking together and doing things. And you're starting to see 
uh, more and more refrigerators and microwaves and teapots and almost everything is getting smart capability there. Okay, some of the other things in the future. Uh, operating systems. Uh, we mentioned that the next version of Windows is coming along, but ideally as we move along, we won't have to worry about the operating system because they're not as important and they can all of these devices can coexist and it doesn't matter what they're written in. And the operating system itself may just be written for that specific device and not used in any other device. So uh, uh, the need to have uh, Windows and the need to have uh, uh, Apple uh, iOS, uh, things start changing there. Batteries. Batteries continue to get longer life, uh, wireless charging, and smaller. Always connected. Uh, notifications and information, whether it's Wi-Fi or now, uh, certainly we're getting more and more rollout of 5G. And 5G doesn't stand for gigahertz. It stands for fifth generation. Uh, the fifth generation still has to be rolled out. Even though your phone may say that you're connected to 5G, most people are not connected to 5G. Uh, my 4G or a 4G will I'll get better performance than your 5G connection. True 5G at its highest speed, which is gigabyte speed, requires that the antenna be two blocks or less from where you're connected. And right now today, that's not true of too many places. So uh, you're connected at a slower speed. Uh, you're still connected. You're just not connected at the high speed and things like that. That'll get better. More antennas are going to get put up, and that's to connect all of these things together. I just got from uh, Excel Energy a new... Uh, uh, meter and that meter is connected through cell data to Excel. So Excel knows when my power is out. If Excel wants to, Excel can shut off my power uh, at any time uh, or they can turn it on without physically coming out and doing anything. And that's a, a money saver for them and uh, also means that I don't have to report a power outage anymore. The, the company already knows that, uh, that there's no power going to my meter. Otherwise, uh, it would show up on their grid. Um, that, that new meter also gives you hourly trends so you can see what, you know, if you go into the, the app, it will tell you how much power you use at 3 o'clock in the morning versus 5 o'clock. Yeah, for those online, uh, Chuck had mentioned that the, the app uh, from Excel also will show you how, uh, how and when you use power there, and, and that'll become important. Now, the downside of that is uh, uh, you're going to have the company starting to charge more. If you're using off-peak uh, uh, kilowatts as opposed to uh, high-demand kilowatts, but uh, certainly uh, uh, it's a good step forward. Okay, next thing, uh, software. Software is being replaced by apps and the internet services. So uh, the days of buying st standalone software, uh, less and less and less is needed there. Uh, less and less local storage. It used to be uh, every year on the survey and that, we looked to see everyone would be buying more storage because storage was cheaper and we were creating more content uh, to store. But now you do have the cloud, and you can store the stuff up in the cloud. And the cloud is much safer and is being backed up, and in most cases is being versioned. So there's so many more advantages than having local storage. Doesn't mean that you totally get rid of local storage, because if you've heard uh, us talk about backup in the past, you do want to have backups of this stuff, and that means some form of local storage but you don't have to be accessing it. Uh, on outages, sure. You know, I, would, I lost internet for about an hour the other day, you know, a few days ago. That still happens, so critical data that you want to make sure you can work on at any time, you probably want to have it. Hey, Chuck mentions that uh, for critical data, you may want to have it uh, locally because of outages. It, certainly that can be an issue. Personally, myself, uh, in the last five years, how often have I been down? 
Power's been out to my house, but I have my phone. I've had, I've had, I, I probably, because of my location, I get an internet outage probably every couple of months. Okay. Hey, but it's most of us have, what I'm saying is most of us have multiple devices and multiple connections, and that can, we won't go into it, but yes, there, you, you certainly want to want to be protected, but the days of, uh, uh, I see more problems with people trying to keep stuff in sync and having yeah. some stuff local than, than the rare chance that uh, they couldn't wait an hour or something to get access to. But uh, to, each, to each their own. Uh, okay, the big thing this year certainly has been artificial intelligence, AI, uh, with chat GPT coming out a little over a year ago. Uh, certainly a lot of things have changed there. You have a lot more machine learning. You have uh, uh, what's called LLMs, large language models, uh, uh, accumulating this uh, intelligence, and then uh, the engine uh, giving the capability to search it. Uh, so you have things like that, uh, Alexa, Google Now, IBM Watson, uh, uh, Dr. Health, uh, so things, things have really uh, progressed uh, in that. Doesn't mean that it's perfect. Uh, in fact, I was, uh, uh, again, giving a demonstration for uh, people in the memory care or have Alzheimer's, and we were talking about things, and I was mentioning uh, the ability to chat. Uh, so you can uh, do uh, artificial intelligence chatting, which is chat GPT is software, but... There are chat bots out there where you can just add, start up a conversation and you can talk about any subject in the world. And I brought up the subject of, uh, this was a couple of weeks ago, and, and I said, uh, let's talk about the Minnesota Vikings. And, and then it responds, uh, yes, the Minnesota Vikings, they were founded in 1899. <laughs> That's what the chat bot thought that they were founded. I'm not sure where it got that. I mean, even the bike, you know, because I was thinking, how did it come up with 1899 as the founding date of the Vikings? Because that's not even the Scandinavian Vikings. Or... <laughs> yeah, right, right. So, so, so AI has a little ways to go, but certainly there's some things uh, that it's very good at in that. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Uh, the ability to work from home, especially with COVID and around the world, anywhere there. Autonomous vehicles. 2020s uh, was supposed to be the decade and still is the decade of the cars, trucks, and drones uh, for uh, uh, autonomous vehicles. So that's, that's a good thing. Security. We have more cameras, more alerts, uh, uh, things like that. Uh, if you're worried about Big Brother, unfortunately, there's uh, you know, we're way past that. There's... Uh, too many devices, too many things out there. Home automation, uh, like we talked about, there's devices for everything. You can schedule, you can uh, do just about anything. The Internet of Things, uh, that falls into the smart devices uh, and connects them, and they're constantly gathering information. And if that information is then used to combine with other data uh, and AI, then all of a sudden it can... Uh, anticipate what we need. It can uh, uh, order stuff automatically for us. It can uh, uh, warm up cars before we even think we need cars warmed up, things like that. Data mining, uh, that's combining data uh, into metadata where everything is uh, available and connected, a single source. Uh, so you're having these giant databases and that, uh, and that's what uh, the large language models and stuff like that do. They're Neural networks, you aren't just putting in a row of data in a particular column or a row. It, it's setting up a neural network like your mind uh, to uh, compartmentalize things and make it faster and easier to search and find data. Education in schools, that's a big question mark. What to teach? What will the jobs in the future be? There's lots of unknowns there. Uh, uh, and certainly uh, classes and stuff like that are changing. Internet, uh, we're all looking for better filters to remove some of the scams, some of the uh, uh, fake information, uh, and uh, hopefully artificial intelligence can help with some of that. Uh, 
but again, there's no panacea that's going to that's gonna snap our fingers and, and work. Doctor visits, uh, remote testing, rehab, uh, testing. I got, a, I got a kick out of, I forgot where I was listening, and they were talking about uh, a new toilet that you can buy. And it analyzes your, your uh, number two every time you go number two. Uh, and so it'll uh, pre-screen uh, for uh, uh, colorectal cancer and some other things. And you don't do a thing. <laughs> satellite, 5G. We talked about 5G. Satellite uh, is up there. At least Elon's got his satellites. I like watching them go across the sky if you ever have a chance to see them. When they do a launch, uh, there'll be uh, kind of a pearl chain or stuff like that. of uh, Maybe anywhere from 6 to 20 of them kind of all together moving across the sky. It's, it's incredible. And if you can't see it, Go online to YouTube and uh, and look it up. Uh, but satellite is out there. I don't look at satellite as the savior uh, for for me in the city for my internet connection because uh, the delays and me sending a signal from my device, whether it's my phone up to the satellite and then back down, is just too great. It's much faster to cut out cut out going up to the satellite if there's a 5G tower or other options. But if you were out in the middle of the country that didn't have some of these other options, that's where satellite becomes uh, the best option. TV streaming and on-demand, uh, basically we've got that today. Uh, on any device, you can watch any content at any time. Wearables, uh, uh, starting all over, watches, uh, uh, healthier, faster, <laughs> Blockchains and distributed ledgers. So blockchains are not, uh, cryptocurrency is not blockchains. Cryptocurrency uses blockchains. But blockchains is a super secure method of storing, authenticating, and protecting data uh, so that it can be accessed and stored. This gets back to uh, just a quick comment on, on Chuck's about losing data. Well, if I use a blockchain to store my document file, if one of these servers goes down, I still have my data. You know, it's, it's the equivalent of you, you have protection. And so uh, your data will get better and better. Uh, and Google certainly does a good job there. Uh, robots. Robots are getting more intelligent, learning, uh, things like that. Today we've touched the tip of the iceberg on the future. The future is so bright we got to wear shades. So uh, that's uh, my conclusion there. Uh, but to me, it's it's an exciting journey uh, that we started on, and uh, it just gets better and better every year with the new technology and the new things. Okay, we'll open it up for questions. I'll see if I can go to the chat here and see. Let me uh, undo my camera here. Uh How long does iPad get security updates? The iPad is governed under the Apple uh, iOS. I believe the current version is 17. Uh, so as long as your device is supported uh, by Apple. Uh, and this is an argument I've had with, uh, with Michael Griffin uh, because there are many... Uh, uh, not many, there are some people in the Mac SIG uh, that believe that they can keep their devices forever and just not upgrade them. And I go, no, the day that Apple stops upgrading your operating system is the day that you should no longer be using that device because there are vulnerabilities in every operating system. Those vulnerabilities, because there's millions and millions of lines of code and nobody's perfect. I was a programmer. I can attest, uh, every piece of code I wrote, not perfect. There's bugs in it. Uh, and so unless those bugs are getting fixed, uh, your machine is vulnerable. And so if a company like Apple is not updating it, uh, you shouldn't be using it. Now, Apple will usually give you at least five to six years. Uh, some of their devices, though, 
I think, uh, I think in the iPhones, uh, the current uh, version, uh, uh, if you wanted to use the current version of iOS 17, I don't believe that works on anything uh, 6 and below. So if you have an iPhone 6 or below, it doesn't work on there. Uh, and uh, that doesn't mean that Apple isn't still doing some patches to some of the versions, but you have to check with Apple to see, uh, to see how long. And, and in the case of an iPad in general, uh, iPads and phones, like we talked about, they come out with almost new models every year. So the iPad is on uh, generation 10. Uh, the iPhone is on 15. <laughs> Uh, so there's been one every, there's been one every year uh, out there, and you typically uh, most people should be using those devices maybe three to four years and then replacing it. So that's my general rule for uh, smartphones and tablets and things like that. And that's also because if you charge your uh, iPhone or or your iPad every day. Uh, in three years, that's roughly three times 365. That's a thousand times that you've charged it. Many of the lithium batteries have a life of about a thousand charges before they start going down more than 30% or 40% of what their original battery life was. So uh, batteries don't last forever. Uh, and it's dependent on the charges and the age of the battery, so you run into that. Kind of like all the, uh, the OS You can never tell. Yeah, uh, Ed, Ed here uh, in person made the comment that the uh, uh, Apple iOS will now tell you if you go to the battery health. Uh, It'll tell you the statistics on how many times it's been charged and the health of the battery compared to uh, a new version. So yes, it is it is important information, uh, and uh, uh, and and it's also true of usually these devices, especially a phone. Uh, a phone, it's a case of uh, after three years or four years, uh, the the. Uh, Screens have gotten better. The CPUs have gotten faster. The uh, everything has improved on it to the point where it's worthwhile to do that to upgrade. Other questions or comments? If you do want to ask a live question, you can unmute yourself uh, and you can show your video if you want. Oh, I'm going to stop sharing. Uh, Forgot to, yeah. Hi, Tom. Okay. This is Paula. Um, can I ask you a question? Sure. Okay. It has to do with Outlook. Um, I believe my Outlook at 3M, like when I use it for email, it has some um, AI to it, and it's been guessing which words I want to write in an email, and all I have to do to accept the choice is use the tab and then if I don't want to accept the choice I just keep typing and I have found it really helpful and I would like to continue not only continue to use that but um, is there a way to make it smarter faster so that it helps me more I don't know of a way to make it smarter faster the companies themselves are using your input and and the way people are using it and improving all the time so uh, without you even doing anything uh, these capabilities have improved so a lot of these capabilities are not just something that popped up in the last year there's something that companies like Google and that have have uh, been working on and built into their email systems and built into these other systems to try and uh, uh, make anticipate uh, what your response may be, anticipate what you're next going to type, uh, anticipate uh, uh, all these other things. And so they're getting better and better at what they do. Uh, I'm not aware. The only way to kind of influence some of these major companies 
is uh, they have people sign up for uh, uh, beta programs or uh, tester programs, and uh, then they get more feedback from people exactly what they're looking for, what worked, what didn't work, and that's what they use to train their uh, artificial intelligence to be better and better. I found one minor improvement people can do is to, when you have words that the dictionary doesn't have, add those to the dictionary and it'll speed you up a little bit. Yeah, Chuck had mentioned that uh, if it's, if it's the, the spell checking or things like that, uh, when it does come up with stuff, uh, add it to your dictionary, and uh, that will mean that it won't come up, or if there's certain acronyms that you use or things like that, adding that stuff in there uh, certainly can uh, clean up your document so, so it's not flagging this as an error when the reality is it's really not an error there. So, no, that's a good tip there. Yeah, yeah. The question was, does it get added to your suggestions? And I, I wouldn't believe so, but then it's a case of since you added it in, you're probably typing everything yeah. correctly. You know, it's not like you're misspelling an acronym that you're using or that, but I, I don't know. Okay, any other questions or comments? Well, get your... Uh, Tom, get your does, um, oh, go ahead. Do the Microsoft products have the AI, uh, like, Outlook or no? Uh, yeah, uh, Microsoft has tried to build it into their stuff, and actually, if you have Windows 11 uh, down on your uh, toolbar, you have Copilot, and Copilot uh, is being is is integrated in with Office 365 now uh, to be able to uh, uh, do some of some of the AI type things, and and uh, Microsoft has been applauded for its approach there because. Just the name Copilot really designates it uh, uh, to what the way that they're implementing AI, meaning it's not going to do everything for you. It's like a co-pilot in a plane. It's there to help you. It's there to uh, do some things, but it's not there to, uh, to be able to do everything there. You, you can use it when you want. You can choose not to use it. So uh, uh, it can help you write things. It can help you plan vacations. It can help you do almost anything you want. But, and, it's, and they're only going to get better. And uh, uh, being integrated in with uh, Office 365 gives a little bit of an advantage, but not so much. I mean, you know... Uh, could I use any other package and, and generate stuff outside of it and then copy it in? Yeah, if I wanted to use BART or I wanted to use uh, uh, some other uh, uh, chat bot or that and copy stuff, it, it's really not hard to do that either. So, you know, it's, it's only going to get better as, as uh, the days and the years and people figure out how to use a lot of this stuff. Okay. Okay, well, thanks for joining. Uh, our next meeting will be in February there, and that uh, the 21st, I believe, and that'll be on uh, passwords and pass keys. Uh, so if you're not familiar with those, or if you've just started looking at them, uh, uh, give them a try, uh, look up some stuff, and uh, uh, we'll see you next month then. Thanks for joining. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. UNA on the stick. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Did for both right the two disciplines. One was called E D. That's a disciplines. Yeah, that was the two A. Yeah. And the one that